A reading from our prayer. O oh Lord, grant that the course of this world may be so peaceably ordered by your governance that your church may joyfully serve you in all godly quietness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you attend a Concordia University, it is a liberal arts, you will have to have a liberal arts degree. So that means that there's a lot of courses that you are going to have to take that you don't want to take. There are a lot of courses that you will take that you are not good at. There are a lot of courses that you're not good at and that you don't like. One of those, for me at least, is anything dealing with math. I, I don't like it. I'm not good at it. And even though I'm not good at it, there was a class that piqued my interest. I still wasn't good at it, but it piqued my interest. Economics. Economics was like the science of math to me. And this is what I learned. And this is about the extent of what I've learned. There is macroeconomics, and then there is microeconomics. And that's it. That's about it. In other words, macroeconomics is the big picture. Societal economic situation or the when, it, when people talk about the economy on the news, they're not talking about your finances at home. They're talking about the big picture. When we're in a recession, we're not talking about you getting your pay cut necessarily, though it contributes to the uh, You get the point. Microeconomics, on the other hand, is how it affects your family directly, your finances at home. In other words, if you're a photography fan, the lens closes down and you're able to focus on the economics of your own home. Am I right or wrong about that? I did learn. All right. Well, when I started to, uh, well, I'll start, I'll start with this. We're going to learn a word today, and the word is proper. Proper in the church mean the list of things that go into a service. That's how we know what uh, for the day is the psalm, the collect, the prayer of the day, the readings um, for, for that day, etc. And so typically I preach on the gospel text. I try to preach on all the text, but I don't want to keep you here all day. So, t typically I focus in on the gospel text and bring things in from the other text. Well, I decided I was going to be bold, and I've done this in the past. I was going to preach on the collect for the day. I was going to preach on the prayer. Grant that the course of this world may be so peaceably ordered by your governance that your church may joyfully serve you in all godly quietness. It was about Wednesday when I realized I can't do that. Because this prayer is macro. It's about the peace of the whole world. But our text is micro. It tells you to forgive your enemies. It tells you to live in peace. And the chain reaction thereabout. So we'll see how it goes. But that was the plan. And I wondered why in the world they put this colic prayer in for this day. 
Now, I thought perhaps it being July 4th, yesterday, that maybe that would have something to do with it peaceably and ordered life. But I believe that that's even micro. Macro would be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Then I thought, well, perhaps we should just take a look at both. St. John Chrysostom, known as Old Golden Tongue, because his sermons were so wonderful that people were just in awe. He once said that the road to hell is paved with the bones of priests and monks and that the skulls of bishops are the lamppost that light the way. How's that for a quote? I also would like to add humbly that the spirit that moves you on that path to hell lighted with the skulls of bishop bishops is self-justification. That's what moves your steps. Trying to justify yourself and your own actions is the quickest way to take a walk to hell and turn it into an all-out sprint. Self-justification is of the most deadly sin. In fact, the unforgivable sin, the motive behind it, is self-justification. You end up making yourself the idol when you end up forgiving yourself. That's why it's rather foolish to say that you can even do so. I could forgive myself for my sins. Who told you that? I did. Oh, so you're the center of the universe. Do you see how it doesn't work? But we do it all the time. And we do it, we, we do it knowingly and we do it unknowingly. We do it as children and we do it as bigger children. What turns in, or what, what begins as he took my toy so I punched him in the face turns into, well, they talk behind my back, so I'm going to talk behind theirs and I'm going to amp it up to 11. You see, we never really grow out of toddlerhood. And we self justify by saying they did it to us first. We even on a macro, on, yeah, on a macro level, can see that with countries. And some is justified, I, I will admit. The Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, that just to throw that out there. The Cold War. You do that, we're going to do this. But on a micro level, Christians cannot bow to the whims of the world. If we bow to the whims of the world, we end up justifying ourselves. And when we end up justifying ourselves, we make an idol out of me. And when we make an idol out of me, all you're doing is repeating the words of Adam and Eve. That's all. You're just going back to the original sin. Ah, oh, you'll be fine, says Satan. God just doesn't want you to eat of the fruit because He knows that you will be like Him, knowing both good and evil. That sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty good. The very sin of pride that, ca that got Satan cast out of heaven is the same one he tempted Adam and Eve with. Don't you want to be like God? I want to be like God. You know what? If you eat that fruit, you'll believe it. You won't be it, 
but you'll believe it. And what's the very next thing that happened? Self-justification. The very next thing. God comes and asks Adam why he's hiding. He said, I was naked and afraid. He then proceeds to blame not only his wife, but God for giving him his wife. In other words, he had two, sep he had, he had two marks of separation away from himself. He double self-justified. Not only is it not my fault, it's her fault and your fault. And we do that all the time. And ultimately, when we do that, it's not my fault, it's their fault. We are, and it must be. It's not my fault, it's their fault. You must also be saying, it's your fault for giving that person to me. I don't care who it is. If you do not repent of your own sin and point to the sin of someone else, you are ultimately saying that God is the sinner. Because you are the one who is in the place of, ju of justice and judgment. That's why I tell people that it's not a sin to be angry with God. You just need time to realize that you're wrong. God's got big shoulders. He's not, his feelings are not hurt when you're angry at him. He's going to give you the time that it takes for you to realize that you're wrong and to repent. But in the meantime, what do, you, what do we do? Self-justify, 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 self-justify. And I will make the example this, in, in this way. <clears throat> The Gospel of Luke says the very first thing, be merciful even as your Father is merciful. That sounds very good. And then comes the, uh, the great exegesis of all atheists and liberals. Judge not and you will not be judged. And there's no more Bible. That's it. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Which is supposed to be a kibosh. It's supposed to be the, the end of the argument. Ah, Bible says judge not, zip it. Well, actually there's more to it than that. Judge not and, you will be not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over in your lap, will be put into your lap. For the measure you use, you use it, we measured back to you. Judging is not a bad thing. It's just not. Discernment is not a bad thing. It's just not. However, when you judge, based on your own self-justification, your own sin, then you're putting, your play, you're putting yourself in the place of God and you're judging them according to your own standards and not by the Ten Commandments and by what God and how God judges. There is your sin. There, judge not as if you are God. You are not. We, none of us sinners stand in a place where we can judge freely. We can't judge freely as if we have no sin. In fact, it, Scripture tells us if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But of course, we have some sins that we pick and we choose and we say are worse than others. And there are other sins that are worse than others. And then we say, well, my sins are not as bad. Therefore, I can judge this way or that way. That is wrong. That is a bad judgment. Don't judge that way. Judge this way. I will love my neighbor. 
I will care for my neighbor. That's a judgment. Because you, rec you judge recognizing that he is your neighbor, she is your neighbor, and you need to love them. What Christ is saying here is by the same judgment that you use to judge others will be the same judgment that you are judged. So you better be loving your neighbor. Further, to cement the reality that each and every one of you believe yourselves whether you want to or not, that each and every one of you are your own self-justifying gods, let me ask you this. In the parable, Christ says, can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not, will they not both fall into a pit? Let's say you are a blind man and you are with another blind man. Who would you prefer to lead? There's your answer. You would. You would prefer to lead. Even though you're just as handicapped as the other person. You want to lead because you think you know best. And it's the exact same thing we do to God. It's the exact same thing. Except He's not blind. That's the, that is the example for sinners. That is the example. Even though I can't see, I can see better than the other guy who can't see. And it's the exact same example that, we, that, that is used once again. Again to the eyes. <clears throat> How can you dare see a speck in your brother's eye with the log being in your own? And the... The, the translation here is uh, often varies. Um, here in the ESV, we see speck and log. Um, I, I, I want to make it clear that it's not a piece of cedar that's sticking out of the eye, because that's what uh, that's what I see. But rather, it is one big and one small that is in the eye of both. And how can a person with a larger log see a speck in the eye of someone else? In other words, realize that you are both sinners, repent, and be forgiven. Because a blind man can't lead a blind man. And a person with a log in their eye, with sin in their heart, cannot judge someone with sin in their heart. We must, we must as blind men feel our way to the bloody feet of Jesus Christ. We must as blind men have the scales fall from our eyes in baptismal waters. And then when we can see clearly the crucifixion of Christ and the merits that bleed onto the cross, or onto, on, onto the, from the cross, onto the altar. Then we can lead our brother. Then we can lead our brother to love, to forgive. Then we can lead our brother to Augustana Evangelical Lutheran Church to say, look, I who once hated you for your sin." have been forgiven by Christ. Join me and forgive me for my hate towards you. The same Savior forgives the same sins over and over and over again. <coughs> Be merciful to one another. Knowing that we're blind men trying to make our way through the world using our shins in a coffee table shop. If you can imagine that. 
We can't do it without the light. We can't make our way through life painless. We have to have the light of Christ to lighten the room. And when the room is lit, we see that we're all naked. Just like Adam and Eve. Ashamed. And Christ says, no, no. For that, for that way, you were born. And in that way, you were reborn. And in this way, you stand fully exposed, sin and all. And I forgive you. By my blood, by my, by my resurrection, and by my ascension. I forgive you of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then Christ says, Go. Do that to everyone you meet in the world. That the world, macro, may actually be peaceable at least until Christ comes to resurrect the living and the dead in judgment, in love, and in justice. Amen.